a man who tried to get away from it all. That is, he tried to get away from God and his responsibility to carry out a challenging assignment that God had given him. And the man, of course, is none other than Jonah. And the reason I wanted to study this book, and it's a very short book, relatively speaking, in the Bible, is because it contains so many good lessons for us today. Romans 15, verse 4, in fact, says, Whatever things are written before were written for our learning, that we, through uh, patience, uh, can derive comfort from the Scriptures and these stories. And this will help us. Now, last week, we covered just the first six verses of the book, so let me just reread those very quickly. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord, this would be direct revelation from God, came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. As I mentioned last week, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, at that time one of the largest cities on planet Earth, if not the largest, but also one of the most wicked cities. It was almost like, in some respects, I guess, America in just one city. They practiced idolatry and even worse things, human sacrifice, ritualistic prostitution, that is prostitution done in the name of religion. Not to mention, they were extremely violent. In fact, in that case, I think they were far worse than we are in America. That is, they showed no mercy whatsoever to their enemies. They enjoyed torturing those who were injured and many of those that they captured in battle. And if that weren't bad enough, the Assyrians were, at this point in time, the arch enemies of the Israelites. They had, in fact, killed, tortured, and enslaved tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of Israelites. And God finally had enough, and he said, that's it. You've gone this far, no further. You're going to have to change, or I will have to destroy you. I don't know how God would have destroyed them. In fact, eventually, eventually he would, many, many years uh, later. But God basically told Jonah, I want you to go in there, go to the capital city, and just warn them for me. Basically, repent or perish. Just as Jesus, by the way, did in his own generation. In Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5, he warned the Jews of his day to repent or perish. Unfortunately, the nation as a whole did not repent. And the consequences came in AD 70, when Jerusalem and many of the surrounding cities and many of the Jews were destroyed and massacred. Well, anyway, God told Jonah, go into that city, tell them to repent, Jonah would have none of it. He hated those people. He knew what they'd done to his own countrymen. And he probably had suspicions of what they would do in the future to his own countrymen. So he wanted them not to repent and be spared. He wanted them to suffer and hopefully be destroyed themselves. So he did not intend in any way, shape, or form to comply with God's command to go into the city, command that the people repent. So verse 3. So Jonah arose to flee, to Tarshish. That was his ultimate destination. Depending on the route he took, it could be between 2,500 and 3,000 miles, all in the opposite direction from Nineveh. So he arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He wanted to put as much distance as possible between himself and God and Nineveh. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it, into the ship, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. It got so bad, they... The sailors, the captain, knew our ship is about to flounder, flounder, if not just be totally broken up on the surface of the raging waves. And the interesting thing is, the storm will get much worse than it is at this point, as we'll see in just a few minutes. The bottom line was, God was not going to just allow Jonah to run away. Not without a fight. God was going to try to get him to change his mind. 
And thank God he tries to do the same with us when he sees us going in the wrong direction. As I shared last week, he's done that with me on numerous occasions. And no wonder, the Lord chastens those whom he loves. And the only reason he'll chasten us, discipline us, punish us, is when he sees that we are going in the wrong direction, Hebrews 12, verse 6. So, the storm is God's attempt, first attempt, to wake up Jonah, to get him to see things right and to do things right. Verse 5. Then the mariners, that is the crew of the ship, were afraid, because, as we indicated, the ship was about to be broken up on the sea. And every man cried out to his God, and of course there were no gods but Jehovah, so they're crying out in vain, they're unheard and unheeded. And the next thing, they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. It made perfect sense. But the weight of the load, of course, was not the problem. The weight of Jonah's sin, that was the problem. And until that sin was addressed, you could throw off everything you want. It's not going to help the ship to survive the storm. Verse 5, continuing. But Jonah had gone down, and I think he's just trying to get farther and farther from God, trying to hide, gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. I don't know how he could sleep during that storm, but I suspect that he wanted to sleep so that he could ignore God and God's presence and God's mission to him. Verse 6, so the captain, and he's doing his best to save the ship, making sure everybody aboard was doing something. If they weren't crying out to their gods, at least throwing something overboard. So he finds him, he came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Wow, but the term fit perfectly. It's like, how can you sleep at a time like this? How can you sleep? You know, God needs to say the same to some Christians at times. How can you sleep right now? I wonder sometimes with the way it is in the world today, the way it is in our country today, oh, maybe, God willing, the worst of the COVID-19 is behind us and will remain behind us. Only God knows. But yet this is no time to sleep. In Romans 13, 11, at a very similar time as... It, to our day to day, Paul said, Arise, you sleeper, talking to Christians who are lethargic or inactive or lazy or lukewarm, whatever. It is high time to awake out of sleep. This is no time to sleep. And we need to work on helping to awaken Christians that are. By the way, this is Jonah's second wake up call. The storm is the first. The captain now finds him, <laughs> wakes him up. That's a second wake up call. Continuing in verse 6, Arise, the captain says, Call on your God. Our gods haven't helped. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. I said last week, there's such an ir ironic thing here, where God originally sent Jonah to wake up a city. Jonah refuses, so now God sends the captain to wake up Jonah. Does he do it? Is he successful? We'll see. I mean, talk about waking him up spiritually. Physically, oh yeah, he wakes up. Verse 7. And they, this is the crew now, said to one another, because they've done everything possible, they're throwing off everything they can, the ship's still in danger. The storm is just raging and it worsens. You'll see that. So they said to one another, okay, this, I, I can just picture, I'll tell you, I cannot imagine... Many deaths, much more frightening than dying during a storm at sea. And how long will you last? If the ship breaks up, will you go down with a ship? That might be preferable. The floating on the waves being battered and eventually going down. So they're panicked, so they're thinking, what are we going to do now? And this is, this is the last resort. Come, let us cast lots. They're superstitious that we may know for whose cause, that is, who's responsible, this trouble has come upon us. Because they all sent, okay, 
This is no ordinary storm. I don't know how they sensed that. Maybe it's because of how fast the, the storm came up. It might have been a perfectly clear day, and all of a sudden they're thrust in the midst of this tempest. But they, they suspect there's a reason for this. This is no accident. Someone, and this is what they believe, someone is being punished. Who is it? And what did he do? You know, in Acts chapter 28, the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked on an island of Malta during a storm which kind of destroyed the ship he was on, on his way to Rome. So as he's there, and it's raining, the storm is raging at sea, but they're on the shore of the, the island, but the storm is raging, so they're cold, they're shivering, so they decide to build a fire on the shore. And as they do so, they're gathering sticks, and the Apostle Paul does this, at recorded uh, um, Acts chapter 28, and, and, a, and a viper comes out of the sticks that Paul is gathering to throw into the fire, and a viper just comes out and latches right onto his hand, bites deeply. And uh, Paul doesn't panic, he just kind of shakes the thing off, throws it into the flames. Well, the islanders see that, and they know the viper, and they know it's poisonous. So they know this man... The Apostle Paul is going to die in a short time. He'll begin by feeling nauseous, and then he will begin swelling, especially beginning with the hand up his arm. And he'll, he'll get deathly sick, and he'll probably be dead before the night is over. And that's what they're expecting. And here's what they think. He escaped the sea, but providence, fate has caught up with him. He's going to die now. Apparently he is a murderer or some horrible criminal. And of course, he doesn't die, he doesn't swell up at all, doesn't suffer any ill effects by the grace of God. And then they know, okay, this man, this man is special. All right, well, in this case, these sailors are thinking, okay, somebody's responsible, we've got to figure out who it is. So uh, verse 7 continuing, so they cast lots. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Clearly, God had a hand in that. You know, when the 11 apostles were trying to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot in Acts chapter 1, they cast lots, believing, having faith that God would have a hand in that. And God did, Acts one twenty six, and the replacement was found Matthias. All right, so they cast lots. This is, this is, and Jonah now, it's, it's clear, and he knows when the lot falls upon him. <laughs> I'm thinking about him just waiting this thing out. I don't know how they were able to pull this off with the this, with this ship rocking back and forth and just being thrown. The sailors trying to hold on to something to keep their balance, but they got to do something. So they try this, and the lot falls to Jonah. This is his next wake-up call, third wake-up call. And poor old Jonah. He'd gone the second mile and then some to hide, to escape, and God says, no way. No way, I'm not done with you yet. It's reminiscent of a passage from the book of Numbers, chapter 32, 23, where Moses speaking to the people. This is a warning from God. You have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can't run far enough to escape your sin. You will. It will catch up with you. God will make sure of that, and that happens here. Now, the question is, does Jonah wake up? The storm, the captain, now the crew casting lots, and all comes down to you, Jonah. Third wake-up call. Are you awake yet? No. Verse 8. Then they said to him, Please, they're desperate. Please, tell us, for whose cause is this trouble come upon us? What is your occupation? I'm thinking, they're thinking, what are you, are you a tax collector? Are you a robber? Are you an embezzler? Are you a lawyer, maybe? Or politician? I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> you know, you must be something bad for all this stuff to come upon us. And where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? In other words, help us understand what's going on here. And he fesses up. He's going to make a confession here. Listen. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord. He uses that word rather loosely. 
Because he doesn't have a lot of fear for the Lord. Not at this point. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, speaking of Jehovah, who made the sea, even in the storm, and the dry land. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. You know, I had to read through that before I figured out, hold it, weren't they afraid before now? You've got a storm that's getting gradually worse. You know what they're afraid of? Jehovah. They've heard the stories about the God of the Hebrews. That this God brought Egypt to its knees. That this God virtually annihilated many cities in Canaan. In fact, some entire nations were taken out by the power of this God in going with the armies of Israel. So I think they're thinking, if this God they call Jehovah's causing the storm, there's no hope. So they said to him, why have you done this? And then it fills in why, because he had confessed, for the men knew that he fled. He was running away from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, confession is good. First John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, right? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, yes, but God also requires repentance. Just saying, God, this is what I did. I'm sorry. That's good. But just saying that doesn't do it in God's sight. God requires a change in behavior and life that reflects what a person says when he says, God, I'm guilty. I'm sorry. Acts 17, 30, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And there's so many in the world who need to. Some of our own probably need to. We can say all day long, again, we're sorry, God. But unless we change, unless we repent, it just doesn't work. Now, the question is, was Jonah now ready to repent? Verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Getting worse, not better. And interesting, even after he confesses, doesn't get any better, just gets worse. And, and you feel for the sailors. I mean, these are basically good men. They don't want to kill this man. Because I, I suppose they fear, well, if we kill him, who knows if the storm might just get so bad, we'll be taken out. And you'll see in verses 13 and 14, they, they don't want to kill him. But they're thinking, well, is there something we can do? Maybe a milder form of punishment that might appease his God? Verse 12. And he said to them, folks, this is a um, solution. But it's not the best. You'll see that. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me. You throw all the cargo. Throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Again, that solution would, it's a good one. And it would save the ship. But it wasn't what God wanted. Just look. And by the way, the confession, again, of Jonah was good but not so good. It's good. He admitted his guilt. He wanted to save the ship and the crew. But he was not ready to repent. Jonah was not fully awake spiritually. He was not ready to repent. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because had he been ready, he would not have said, listen, throw me into the sea, then you'll be all right. If he'd repented, he'd say, listen, go back, turn back toward Nineveh. Get me as close to Nineveh as you can get me. That's what we need. And he was not going to do that. Instead of that, throw me over the side. Do you know what Jonah was saying? I'd rather drown than go to Nineveh and help possibly save those people. That's what he was saying. That's so, so sad. You know what? I could continue, but I think I'm going to pause here because I'm, as I get into 13 following the end of the chapter and then chapter 2, 
Oh, it just, well, it gets more exciting, as many of you are aware. But let's just stop right here and just ask, what can we take away from the story thus far? Five things. Number one, praise God. As I mentioned, He will not let us run away without trying to stop us. Number two, if, he, if we are sleeping, God will try to wake us up. He won't keep doing it forever. But he will try in his own way. The third lesson, and this is the problem, the longer we sleep, the harder it is to wake us up and the more drastic measures God has to take. Now, if we get to the point where God knows we will not wake up, then he just won't continue. Number four, our sins will find us out. You can't just, well, okay, I've done this and... And you know what? I, I, I'll run away from responsibility, whatever, you know. They'll catch up to us unless we do something. And number five, maybe the most important lesson for this specific study tonight, confession is good, but the, without repentance, it's worthless. It really is. In fact, this is our invitation. Let me read from the words of the prophet Joel as he's speaking to Israel. But he speaks... Far, to far more people than just the rebellious and sleeping of Israel. This certainly would apply to Christians under the New Covenant. He says this, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. The fact of the matter, many in Israel believed in God and were following him to some degree but their hearts were not 100% with God. They were with other things or concerns or worries or whatever. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart, not your garments. The Jews were so famous when they were caught in sin or somehow felt they had to admit their sin, they would tear their clothes to show how sorry they were. And then after the crowds would say, oh, pat them on, but good for you. Oh, that's, you know, wonderful that you did that. Then they'd go out, put new clothing on, and go right back into the sin. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. A lesson for many in our country, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank God there that he'll do everything possible to get us back to him. Most of you are already following him to do the best of your ability and keep doing that. Let's have one more prayer. Our Father again, thank you for this great, great book. I mean, there are so many lessons and as I mentioned last week, I look into my own past and my own sins and things that I wanted to run away from or cover up or whatever. And you had to deal with me. And thank you for doing that. You didn't have to. You did. And I know others can say the same thing who are here tonight. And if there's any aspect of our life, Father, anything that's keeping us from being as faithful as we can be, not, not that we'll be perfect, we know that, but if, if we know something is weighing us down, help us, Father, to confess and repent and do our utmost, at least the best we can do, to please you, to serve you, to not let anything get in the way. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for chasing us when it's needed to try to call our name, to tell us to come home. 